Well, hi everyone, and welcome to today's lecture, which launches the Conversations on Venice lecture series this term. And uh, I'm really delighted to introduce it because the series brings together architects, educators, curators, community organizers, and so many others who are involved in the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, each session invites a selection of nat national pavilions and Biennale contributors, most of whom have connections to the AA, to discuss common themes that span across their installations in Venice and beyond, um, to address issues of care, mutuality, context, collaboration, and above all, togetherness. So originally scheduled to open in May 2020, uh, the Biennale was postponed by a year to 2021 as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the theme chosen by Hashim Sarkis, the curator of this edition of the Biennale, was How Will We Live Together? And it proved to be more prophetic than anyone originally realized, with all participants having an additional year to reflect on not just their contributions, but the role of architecture in a time of crisis. And it's also allowed us to invent all sorts of new forms of collaboration and ways to realize pavilions even from afar. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manisha Verghese. I'm the head of the A Public Program. And uh, while today I'll be um, helping to moderate the session next week, I'll actually be a participant in the session. So um, that'll be a kind of unique experience for me. Um, but today, together with Francesca Del Alio, who has both reviewed this year's Biennale and also taught a summer school unit called Reporting from Venice, um, which delves deeper into the role of the Biennale within architectural culture and discourse. So together, we'll be moderating today's conversation. And um, the discussion will be between the curators and architects of the Polish and the Saudi National Pavilions, um, and will address forms, well, new forms of living, um, dwelling and planning, whether they be rural or urban. And uh, I think while the Polish Pavilion looks at the European post-socialist countryside and is looking at developing new opportunities and strategies for reintroducing the commons into the rural, the Saudi Pavilion moves beyond the domestic to look at urban enclosures needed to accommodate large groups of people as a result of pilgrimages or pandemics with architectures that sit at the intersection of quarantine, hosting and housing. So together, we're really excited to debate the conditions needed in these contrasting rural and urban contexts and to test and propose new forms of living. Um, to briefly introduce the speakers, um, to represent the Polish Pavilion, we have Wojciech Masan, um, who's an architect who graduated with a, a MPhil in architecture and urban design from our Projective Cities program here at the AA and previously studied in Poland and the Netherlands. Um, in 2017, he co-founded the architectural practice Prologue, who are curating the Polish Pavilion at the Biennale Architectura 2021, and um, we're presenting the project Trouble in Paradise on the Polish countryside. And then to represent the Saudi Pavilion, we have both curator Murtha Savali and architect Hussam Dakak. Um, uh, Murtaza is a cu critic, curator, and art historian based in Sharjah and Brooklyn, whose research interests include materialist art histories, eccentric minimalisms, the weight of color, and contemporary art emerging from the area around the Indian Ocean. Um, and then together with Usma Rizvi, he is a co-curator of the Saudi Pavilion at the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. And uh, Hussam is an architect based in London, who's a partner at Studio Bound. Uh, he graduated from the Diploma School at the AA and has served as the program director of the AA Jeddah Visiting School since 2015. Um, together with his co-directors at Studio Bound, uh, Basma Kaki and Hessa al Bada, they designed the exhibition accommodations within this year's Saudi Pavilion. So you can read the, the longer bios to like really uh, account for all of the incredible success of everyone's uh, on the panel today on the AA website. But before I hand over to Voce to begin um, and tell us more about the Polish Pavilion, uh, just a few notes on the format. Um, to start, there'll be a short presentation about each of the pavilions. And following that, Francesca and I will ask some questions to start the conversation before opening it up to the audience for a wider discussion. So throughout the, the presentations and the conversation, feel free to post any questions that you have in the chat at any point and we can either ask it on your behalf or if you feel comfortable um, just uh, use the raise hand function and we can unmute you so you can ask your question and uh, especially during the discussion if you feel comfortable to do so if you don't mind turning on your camera that would be great um, so we can at least feel like we're in some sort of space together despite the series being held online um, so without further ado I'll hand over to Voce to start the presentations yeah So let me share the screen. Uh, is it visible for everyone? Yeah, okay. Yes. So yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation. I think that's uh, quite nice to be back at DAA since the project itself uh, has actually foundation uh, at DAA's uh, Projective Cities since it started with my dissertation uh, 
uh, at the program. So then it actually followed uh, to uh, be the curatorial proposal and then the exhibition at the Architecture Biennale uh, to represent the Polish pavilion. So I'm going to present briefly uh, our exhibition, uh, which is entitled Travel in Paradise. First of all, I think it's uh, worth to mention that it is uh, a, collabor a collaborative effort. So we are actually curators or curators. Uh, we are six curators, uh, which is Prolog plus one. Uh, and we worked together on the proposals since uh, the very beginning. So first of all, the project departs from the notion that Poland has the 90% uh, of the territory considered to be rural. And this staggering fact actually worked for us as a point of departure, which we realized later on that creates some kind of problematic state. So in order to understand what is constituating the 93% of the rural areas in Poland, we use the form of panorama, uh, which presents a space that doesn't exist really in neither point of the Polish map, it represents a fictional landscape. So in order to create this fictional landscape, we use techniques of uh, photography to then actually use elements, different elements that are constituting the countryside for us that are important elements, spatially and uh, socially, etc., etc., that are that are creating the space of the countryside. We selected them and then through the assemblage and collage methods, we assembled the entire panorama that is actually exhibited within the pavilion. So standing within the pavilion, in the middle of the pavilion, people visiting the, the space are enclosed within the landscape of the Polish countryside. And as I mentioned, this is a 360 panorama, which represents idea of the Polish countryside rather than an exact space. So therefore, through the means of representation of panorama, it tries to, um, to some extent, uh, present it as a real space, but it actually doesn't. Uh, what I mean by this is that the landscape itself is constructed through elements that are constructing the landscape. So in order to achieve this, as I mentioned, we looked for elements that are creating this landscape, the elements that are transforming it, the elements that are constituating it, and the elements that are uh, basically to some extent making the rural landscape and the countryside not the space of natural landscape that is untouched by human uh, endeavor, but is actually totally created. So therefore this creation, first of all, of the landscape itself by us and their creation of the panorama, it works as a twofold idea. And then to try to bound this with the with the topic of the of the today's conversation, which is the new forms of living, I'll briefly explain uh, the idea that was behind looking for the elements that that are presented within the panorama itself. So we went through historical analysis of three periods. And within these three periods, we look at three distinctive uh, forms of dwelling and work uh, within the countryside. From, so from the left, we look at the uh, farm set, which, uh, which for us is an exemplary project for the early capitalist period. Then we looked at the state agricultural farms, which are representing the socialist period of the Polish countryside. And then at the very end, we looked at the single family houses that are representing the late capitalist period that is still currently ongoing within the Polish countryside. So in order to understand how these three elements or these three forms of uh, living and then modes of uh, working are operating within the countryside, I'll present them briefly. So we always looked at them through lens of three, uh, scales, so through the scale of territory, settlement and dwelling, and each of them operates within the rural landscape uh, in a different manner in those three uh, distinct uh, scales. So from the from, from the uh, farmstead itself, it starts as a close, con close connected uh, space of living and working, where the land is directly connected to the farmstead itself, and then the farmsteads are spread around the landscape quite evenly to be able to actually uh, retain the pro productive functions within the landscape and the close connection to the uh, to the land that is farmed by the family living within the farm. So, so there is a close connection between work uh, and living within the landscape. Then in the second period, which is the socialist period, uh, the state introduces uh, a new form of living within the landscape, which creates a disconnection uh, from the ground, which is the multi-family housing, uh, which is to some extent uh, a form that is uh, quite radical for the for the countryside, which was always filled with the houses uh, for, for multi-general families. And then this introduces a, 
a nuclear family model within the countryside, but also most importantly, I think it, it, it it underlines the disconnection from the ground uh, on two levels. First of all, that the flat itself is disconnected from the ground, that it doesn't have any connection to the ground itself. And second of all, that the uh, families living within the, within the dwellings are actually not owning any land. They are just uh, enrolled within the state agricultural farm to, uh, to work on the land that is state owned. So this creates again a, a different transformation of the modes of living and working within the countryside. And then the last one, which is uh, the one that we observe uh, currently, is the single family house. And this is basically driven by the forces of suburbanization, which creates a state where people are living within the countryside, but their connection to the landscape is basically not existing. So therefore, they are basically having their life placed within the countryside, within the bounds of the house, but actually their everyday functions are held within the city. So basically there are commuters living and just occupying the space within the countryside rather without having any other connection to it than just sleeping there. So that's basically it uh, to introduce the Polish Pavilion. I hope we will uh, uncover more within the, within the discussion itself. So thank you. And I'm giving the stage back to I think manager. Thanks, Fauci. That was really fascinating and lots of themes to pick up in the discussion. But I'll now hand over to Hassam, who's going to share screen to do their presentation. Um, I'll hand it over to Murtaza, who's going to take over the first part, and then um, uh, I'll take over after Murtaza. So Murtaza, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Manija and Francesca from uh, uh, Architectural Association. It's an honor for me um, to kind of be included in this program um, and in these discussions. Um, um, I just want to start off by saying that Hussam and I are also representing uh, <clears throat> a larger team um, with uh, our uh, my co-curator is Marizdi and uh, Hussam's um, co-directors. Um, Basma Kaki and Hesel Badr not being here. Um, but uh, uh, Safai, I mean, um, the exhibition would not have been possible without them. So important to acknowledge them. And of course, also the team at the National Pavilion of Saudi Arabia. Um, we just thought that um, we would show you, um, our, our exhibition was uh, divided into three discrete spaces. And it's hard to get a really good sense for the whole um, pavilion from a single shot. Uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, the Polish pavilion we just saw. So we're just gonna start off with a, with a brief video that gives you both um, a sense of the space and some details. Um, and then I'll say a few words and then uh, Hussam will say a few words and then hopefully uh, we'll be able to flesh things out in the uh, Q&A that follows. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you so much um, uh, for that, Hassan. Um, so I just want to start off uh, with introducing the curatorial concept a little bit. We were, uh, my co-curator and I, we were one of the few teams that actually were, I think, were onboarded um, post-pandemic. And so our, uh, our curatorial brief was very much uh, determined by what we had experienced in New York to do a three months preceding um, uh, our preceding the invitation. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the, this pavilion is in, in some sense very much not adapted to the pandemic, but a direct response to the pandemic. And then also was its production was very much shaped by the conditions of the pandemic uh, as well. Um, we were immediately, because of everything we had been, in, uh, endured uh, in, in March, April, May, um, in New York City, the constant sirens, the case numbers, the fear, the, hosp the images of hospitals, the overflowing infrastructural facilities. Um, we, were, we immediately thought about doing something around the ideas of infrastructures of care and hospitality. And most interestingly, how those two uh, kind of uh, impulses uh, intersected. Um, and uh, within the Saudi context, we immediately also thought about how those, uh, how um, pandemics intersected with uh, a pilgrimage um, because of the uh, the Hajj, the the Saudi monarch. Uh, one of it, one of his um, titles is the custodian of the two holy shrines. And um, so, what emerged through our exhibition was this idea of of care and hospitality, both as uh, as uh, as political responsibilities, as uh, as extra statecraft in a way, um, and we were also really interested in, uh, given uh, Saudi Arabia's history and also its relationship uh, uh, through the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean to other parts of the Indian Ocean, but also its more recent uh, um, relationship with uh, uh, migrant uh, labor. We were also really interested in using the pandemic as a prompt through which to investigate uh, how Saudi Arabia's uh, tradition of engaging with an, with an other. So the virus became a metaphor for all types of others. And uh, the response to the pandemic, both historical and contemporary, became um, a lens through which we could uh, sort of think about how one engages uh, um, an unexpected or an untimely or an unfamiliar guest from elsewhere. Um, so as we started doing research, uh, uh, one of the first things we came across um, were what, what's called in the historical literature islands of quarantine. They were basically um, uh, islands set up around the perimeter of the Red Sea that were set up in the, in the second half of the 19th century as a um, way of uh, trying to control the spread of cholera from South Asia uh, through Hajj. Uh, and the Red Sea, uh, and then on to Europe. Um, there were a series of cholera outbreaks. They were all thought to have originated in South Asia, kept be carried over by pilgrims to the Hejaz, and then from the Hejaz taken to the West. So the Western powers were very invested in uh, kind of figuring out ways of controlling that spread. Uh, Turkey, as the kind of people who were overseeing the Hejaz at that point in time, and also as this kind of threshold space between Europe and Asia, were kind of involved in administering these ideas. Um, and so one of the so solutions was these islands of quarantine, which were basically in the Red Sea, um, a little bit off the coast, and basically were spaces of quarantine. Uh, they were spaces where incoming uh, ships were waylaid and the, the passengers held under observation for a couple of weeks. Um, and then um, once they were deemed to be uh, safe, they were allowed to proceed. Uh, we thought this idea of the islands of quarantine was a really useful metaphor through which to explore how one responds uh, to this uh, kind of perceived threat of an unfamiliar other. Um, and so the first part of the exhibition, the central lobby area, was basically a look at the islands of quarantine at different scales, um, to look at the islands themselves, of which there's very little actual uh, visual documentation uh, or architectural documentation. And then to see the way in which the structure, this is actually one of the few ones that we have some photographs of. It's called Kamaran Island, and it's halfway between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, and these are, of course, uh, the image, uh, and the image on the right is of uh, uh, Suakin, which is off the coast of Sudan, so on the southern side of the uh, Red Sea. Um, and then we, we kind of trace the way in which this motif kind of uh, eventually gets uh, brought on shore. And so first there are, 
structure set up in the port of Jeddah to uh, uh, administer and monitor incoming pilgrims. Then there's a quarantine area set up nearby, which now is uh, has produced a neighborhood um, named Quarantina, which is a, a place where a lot of uh, 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 illegal migrants kind of gather. Um, and then, you know, as it, uh, and then it transformed into other architectures, uh, architectures that were meant to house pilgrims and have become spaces where uh, um, marginal or disenfranchised uh, parts of the population are often housed as well. And then to bring it to the contemporary moment, we also looked at um, the setup of uh, uh, makeshift emergency uh, overflow health facilities in the contemporary moment. Um, we did also trace these ideas through two other motifs, and I'm going to let Hussam talk about those two. They're a little more modern in origin, and then hopefully we can speak a little bit more about these ideas in the Q&A. Uh, yeah, thank you, Murtaza. So one of the spaces um, within our exhibition, which is uh, key to the theme, is exploring the contemporary motif related to quarantine, and that is the hotel. And we look at the hotel as a civic structure where basically crucial to the discussion of the hotel and referencing to what Murtaza said, uh, realizing that imbricated within the history of quarantine in Saudi Arabia, which is this notion of hospitality, underpinning the quintessential custodianship and duty of care. And the hotel is merely a contemporary rendition of that. I mean, obviously it doesn't escape us that hotels worldwide were used as quarantine facilities in the past uh, year or so. But within the context of Saudi, the hotel really registers as a key civic institution and really the hotel's relationship to the nation and nation state is something that has been widely covered, not only in the pandemic, but also in previous years. So in this instance, the structure of the hotel works to basically demarcate ter the territory as a threshold and a gateway into the country. Uh, and in, in this instance, within the context of Saudi, carefully recording and basically registering all arrivals and departures. And it actually cements the politicization of the domesticated enclaves of the hotel rooms and the whole hotel more widely as a vehicle of government oversight, uh, so to speak, extra, state, extra statecraft. So the hotel basically is explored as a guest house, which its evolution is actually interestingly traced back to something called as Qasr al diyafa which is uh, uh, in Arabic means the palace of hospitality. And within Saudi, the hotel, upon its arrival um, in, the, in the 50s, basically afforded a spatial typology to the city that was actually novel to the landscape of the city. And it still actually, interestingly, remains novel, not only within Saudi, but within the wider Gulf region. Like hotels really have this like unique, unique pseudo free status zone. And one of the hotels that we really look into within the context of our exploration is Hotel Al Yamama in Al Riyadh, uh, highlighted here in red um, of a drawing that we mapped out. And it's, uh, it actually doesn't basically no longer exist, but at the time of its uh, inception, it, um, it served as a geopolitical instrument within the domain of a city, with the city acting as an extension to the civic and political economies of the city. And this like interpenetrated social and political role of the hotel serves as a precursor as we explore the hotel as a key typology of quarantine within the exhibition. Um, another hotel um, in relationship to the medical infrastructure and care is, uh, is Marit Khares and Riyadh, where we note the expanded role of the hotel as an extension of the medical infrastructure and the wider nation where in this instance, the hotel was literally transformed into a medical facility and a hospital uh, through its architecture and through its spaces. Um, and then uh, just coming to one of uh, the, basically the last section of the exhibition, um, um, looking at the notion of the home and what that means within uh, our sphere of discussion. Um, within the context of the home, we really wanted to understand its relationship to quarantine and in doing so, what that did for us, it really brought forth debates on privacy, which um, on privacy within the home, which is a foundational aspect of the concept of the home, mainly with how the home has actually developed within the context of Saudi Arabia. Um, like the role of privacy as it relates to the home was in fact revolutionized with the arrival of uh, the American oil company Aramco, which reinforced thresholds with its imported typologies and introduced the phenomenon of what we know as the island home centered on a nuclear family style living arrangement. So in turn, boundaries over time in Saudi would become more pronounced where family dynamics were reimagined and re-engineered. So there are two interesting parameters I want to highlight here, which is uh, here is the label of the island home, because that is something that was further cemented during COVID where our homes really became our islands. But also that one of the key transformations to the home dynamic came by way of outdoor space actually, and the role of the garden. 
because the garden during COVID, interestingly enough, is also what really became activated um, in lieu of uh, the use of indoor spaces. And lastly, like an additional component that I want to highlight uh, to the study of the home is while we were physically isolated during quarantine in our homes, we were obviously all digitally connected. And this presents a question of the like techno political ramifications of the role of technology within the home and oversight to the most private spaces of our home. And in such an instance, the home undergoes like a reciprocal dis disposition of both uh, liberation and inadvertent jurisdiction through like the technoscapes um, it um, encounters. And it basically forces the evacuation of many spaces within the home that were purely designed for hospitality, which again was a foundational aspect of the Saudi home. So just to summarize, like really across all the three different categories that we explore in our exhibition, like our show really, this is where our show really takes place and enacted through this exploration, I suppose we acknowledge that the, we, what we do is we acknowledge the ordinary as extraordinary in an attempt to decipher the question basically of Venice, of how will we live together? Um, and really the exhibition is envisaged as a form of interconnected moments. Each one presents like a vignette, so to speak, that seeks to explore these interrelated concepts of accommodation. And what it really, for us, which was very important, it really brings forth um, material, like archival material that was never seen before in Saudi. And that is actually something very critical because the country has such a rich and discursive material history, which is not usually explored. And that's something that our exhibition uh, heavily centers on. So I'll leave it at that so that we can open up for discussion. Um, so thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much, um, both uh, pavilions <laughs> for for the presentation has been like, it's, it's always, interesting i think like i've i've known a bit more the the polish pavilion but of course i read quite a lot about the, the saudi pavilion too and it's quite interesting how you always discover something new when you hear the pavilion explained by the through the words of the curators i think that there is something quite fascinating about how a research also takes different shapes also according i think also for you according to the different different sort of iteration of your presentation, you have presented probably this pavilion a lot of time. You might be tired probably even of presenting it, but I think that every time you probably add and discover something new, and I think that adds probably up to the to the following presentation. And I think that that's, that's really, I think for me, the synonym of research, right? Like that doesn't finish with just, just the exhibition or the Biennale itself, but is really something that continues almost in perpetuity. Um, and I think that there is, uh, well, there is a lot. I think there is really a lot of richness in both pavilions. Um, and I really agree because a lot, both pavilions have so much archival uh, research, uh, which I think is extremely rich. And this is, I think, one thing that really belongs to both of you, but also one of the things that I really appreciate of both presentation is that the sort of emphasis on the collective work, uh, which is not just a collective work of mainly architects, but is maybe also a collective work of friends, a collective works also of, of different kinds of backgrounds. But you really like denote this, um, this sort of richness of the profession, right? Like also richness of our discipline as an architecture. We don't just behave, we don't just deal with it just as architect, but we really is a sort of like, choral uh, dialogue between different sort of, uh, uh, between different individuals, between different expertises, right? Between different disciplines. And I think that in both cases, there is something that is really emerged in, in both pavilions. And then there is another thing that I also really like the fact that both pavilions also, um, first of all, respond quite directly, I think, to the question of the Biennale, which I find extremely fascinating that the Biennale this year, the title is a question and has never been the case before, right? Like the Biennale has always been like an assertive topic, maybe one word, which has been really like, really strong. But this year there is so much uncertainty and it's almost like, as Nani just said really at the beginning, it's almost like Ashim almost predicted this. He's really like, that question is there and he's asking everyone. And in both your, your case, there is this sort of like, um, I think there is a sort of different ex exploration of 
two different connotations of isolation, right? Like an isolation that in both cases, I think also doesn't deny the presence of a subject within it, right? Either the subject construct that sort of environment of isolation or the subject participate actively to it. But there is also this sort of beautiful question of what isolation means. What does it mean to isolate, right? And what does, what, how does architecture contribute to these ideas of isolation? And one maybe final comment, and then um, I have maybe one just for question to start asking, um, to just start the conversation. My final comment is that I think both of you also, there is this quite interesting parallel between both pavilion. There is this also cross-scale reading of architecture, right? Like in, in the Polish pavilion, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite clear and is also very well represented, I think, in the Polish pavilion in the the outcomes and the materials of the exhibition but also in your case is sort of is almost like thematic like the island and the hotel and the home they are can, they can be considered three different scales of, of interpretation of isolation and um well there is one thing that really captured my attention in both presentation and there is one drawing in the polish pavilion which i've never seen before but it's the construction of that curtain of that panorama and I'm so interested by that. I'm so intrigued in that process. And then I, I am that drawing also. I, I really was quite struck by the, by the drawing of the, um, of the. I think it was of the hotel, right? Like the one with the, that has like there is the colorful drawing, and then there is the kind of black and white drawing in that axle. I think both drawings are so eloquent and so telling. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious to hear a bit more about that as a process of thinking and researching and also as, a, as, a, as an artwork at the end of the day, right? Like it's something that sits there in the exhibition and people look at it and just look very in detail or just are fascinated by it. So it's just these two drawings, which is of course the drawing in as architects is our instrument, is our tool. Uh, but it's something that is extremely variable, right? Like it's something that is extremely rich and it is in constant kind of um, challenge, is a constant challenge to produce a drawing according to a specific topic. So yeah, that's my first intrigue. Of course, I have tons of other questions, but I'm gonna start with, from a very simple one <laughs> and then, yeah, let you do. Should I go first uh, with the, yeah, I'll, I'll try. So maybe I'll just share the screen again so we can bring the, the drawing back. Uh, so I can actually maybe look at it. Yeah, uh, is it visible? I think, yeah. Uh, yes, so that was, it's, yeah, I don't know where to start because it's a drawing that uh, reminds so many stories and it's actually to some extent a drawing that uh describes the process itself because first of all i think it's worth to mention that the panorama was done by um, artist jan domich with help of two photographers michael sierakowski and pavel stages so they are responsible for the for the panorama itself our involvement was on the side of the let's say the conceptual framing of the topic so what we were looking at were was actually the selection of elements, but then the elements, the photographs of the elements, their uh, assemblage, et cetera, et cetera, that's the work of the guys that I mentioned. But for us, what was important was to include the elements that we thought are important for the creation of the countryside as we know it and as we experience it. But for the guys then, what was important was how the panorama will be uh, experience within the space because the Polish pavilion is a uh, rather small pavilion. It, it has a rectangular shape. So what we've done within the pavilion is that we introduced the form of panorama, which is this elongated ellipse kind of thing. Uh, so what they have done, they, they actually started uh, sketching the perspectives that uh, work within this space and they're trying to construct the landscape on top of this. So maybe to explain a bit the drawing, what they started with was the background and then the first uh, vantage points and lines of perspective to fit the space itself. And then they were filling it with the elements that they, that we were feeding them through the list. So we were we were talking about elements that are, I don't know, uh, the thief that is uh, disconnecting the fields, the roads, the um, electrical poles, etc. 
etc., etc., etc. And they were finding the elements and then introducing them within the uh, within the landscape that they were creating. So I find this, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is a collaborative process from our side, but uh, I think it's worth, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it, it's important to underline that actually the, the final product uh, wasn't ours to some extent. And I mean, we were involved in the conceptual phase, but Jan Domsch, he was the one uh, actually making it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this is also, let's say, the, uh, the evidence of our long uh, and heatful discussions. <laughs> to maybe summarize the drawing itself. Um. I can jump in with a quick I comment can... and then I'll let Hussam uh, talk about the drawing in detail. Um, uh, thank you very much for that. those comments, Francesca. One thing that I think also unites our two pavilions is uh, it's not just the experience of isolation under um, um, under under the conditions of quarantine because our, our pavilion really was looking at the conditions of quarantine and what happens when that when a condition that is a state of exception usually becomes the norm and becomes a global norm in this case. Um, but the other thing that that uh, the forced isolation of quarantine also did show was the uh, how important and how urgent collectivity is, and also the commons are. And I think you know in an interesting way this is a link between uh, uh, our our pavilion and the Polish pavilion too, because they were looking at um, especially during the so socialist period uh, visions of collectivization within the rural countryside. Um, and and so you know we were trying to explore that both historically as uh, looking at a, a kind of a historical basis for it, and then tracing it all the way to the contemporary through the hotel and through transformations in the hotel and the uh, uh, the home as sites uh, of both quarantine but also sites of hospitality. Um, I'll let Hussam discuss the drawing uh, in yeah. more detail. Yeah. So I mean. Um... Just in direct response to the question of how this, well, first I'll explain what this drawing is. So the, basically the drawing really aims to capture um, the case study of Hotel El Yamama as it sits on a crucial road in Riyadh called Airport Road. And um, a lot of the buildings are, which are annotated are um, government and ministerial buildings. And basically here you see like a sectional cut through the lobby because it's genuinely, this is the hotel that acted as the forum for government spaces when the government bodies would meet. So this just further underlines the hotel's civic role within the development of the history of Riyadh. But um, unfortunately, this is the kind of drawing you kind of have to see in person because it's quite detailed. Um, but in terms of how this drawing came about, I mean, this, this as well was genuinely a group effort between myself and my partners. And like, and that's when I, I suppose when I closed my um, talk, I was saying like, there is for us the uh, gen genuine value in bringing our work to Venice is uncovering a lot of this archival and material history because there was basically none of this was documented. So Al Yamama Hotel has been demolished for circa nine plus years. There was barely any um, documentation of the hotel. So in order to recreate a lot of, um, so in order to basically generate all these drawings, we relied heavily on old photographs, we relied on poetry, we relied on script, we had to basically kind of um, not necessarily imagine, but like put together missing pieces of the puzzle in order to come up with this uh, visual depiction because the, and basically this drawing is a combination of many disciplines. Yeah, yes, it was developed by uh, us as Studio Bound, but we relied a lot by speaking to a lot of historians as well just to also explain how, how the hotel would sit and how its lobby would look because, yeah, there was basically no physical documentation um, of this hotel other than in, you know, on Twitter or like newspaper articles or what you hear. So, yeah, that was basically how that drawing came about um, and a lot of the work. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's I mean Sorry, go for it. No, I was just going to say, I also wanted to jump in, uh, jump in and just underline um, something that Hussam spoke about, about how this, these, actually both of these projects, they, 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 they might feel like they're archival in that they're drawing on archives, but actually they're, they're very much, uh, especially in, in, in contexts where there is a kind of like a uh, archival inaccessibility or an archival po paucity, um, there are also uh, projects, and I actually think this is also true about uh, Wojcik's uh, pavilion as well. They're 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 also um, involved in processes of archival generation. Uh, I mean, with this, uh, we were um, 
it was an it it was an attempt to draw things out of like uh, archives where they're hidden and bring them out into public space. Um, and I think you know to some degree with this creation of the vision of a landscape, I think the Polish Pavilion was doing something similar as well. Uh, so I just wanted to underline that archives are very fraught. Uh, and in some cases, in non-existent institutions within the Gulf. Um, and so any archival project always has that uh, background that it is working uh, against. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. And it was actually really interesting to hear both, both pavilions reflect on the drawing, as Francesca described it, as the kind of instrument, um, but also as a tool. I think both of you talked about it as a tool to have a conversation, whether that's through um, with the collaborators you're working on the project with, but also with other stakeholders uh, in like in that context or in uh, the decision makers. And I guess as another question, I wanted to pick up on something. I think Ruth, is you the word you used of extra statecraft, which is often applied to to kind of all the things in cities that are kind of beyond the like maybe the control of the state, but are are equally important. But I guess applying that to the rural as well, and in how the Polish pavilion, you guys really identified all these elements that are needed in order to to kind of rethink the rural. And I I was curious as to maybe to hear both of both pavilions reflect on the role of the architect in doing that, both in bringing people around a table to have a conversation, to rethink the hotel, the importance of the hotel um, uh, or these like extra state elements um, that, that we, that we need to design, but also that, that everybody maybe needs to be part of that conversation and how to advocate for the architect to, to not just draw these things into existence or into memory through the archive, but also to, to shape a conversation around what they should be going forward. I don't know, do, I mean, maybe Hussam and, and Ruthsai, maybe you want to start this time. Um, Ruthsai, did you want to start? And I'll, I can tell <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I'm uh, the best uh, qualified to, to speak about that. I mean, one of the things that we're, uh, as, as co-curators we were very in, interested in was learning from history. And there is a very, very rich history of um, infrastructures of care and hospitality within the Saudi context, uh, precisely because it's the site of pilgrimage. Um, and you know that's borne out, of course, uh, and quite well known um, in the infrastructure that's developed uh, in and around Mecca. But it it also uh, appears in other in many other different guises. So one of the ideas was to you know um, turn the turn a light or a lens on. Um, the history of this kind of management of uh, of uh, pandemics, of pilgrimage, of uh, threat from the outside, of guests, um, of hosting, um, and then you know think about how one can be maybe more equitable or egalitarian moving forward, uh, and keeping that in mind. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we we I shouldn't say we. Um, I was very very much uh, also inspired by Beatrice Colomina's idea of Sikh architecture. And so we really approached the urban as these uh, as these palimpsests of pandemics past. So the historical aspect of it was really an attempt to kind of uncover and reveal those layers that once the crisis uh, goes away, it kind of fades. Um, um, in terms of actually kind of uh, uh, producing workable outcomes out of some of our ideas and some of the research, I think Hussam uh, will be better equipped to uh, answer that. Um, yeah, so many, if I understand your question correctly, like the role of the architect towards generating the discourse and within the domain of what we did, I think um, uh, for us, I think one thing to preface this by saying is because Saudi um, at the moment um, is undergoing so much change and there's so much development happening, it's really like um, it's a, um, everything is happening on an accelerated timeline, so to speak, so that what I think you're interesting is actually quite your question. Sorry, it's quite interesting because the role of the architect within the context of the Saudi is changing, even as we speak. I think um, with the practice of what we do as architects within the Saudi is is yet evolving, um, and we've witnessed that with how uh, we've actually come to work on this exhibition. Because, um, like I think for us, the the like the architect, so to speak, our architect hat in this instance was genuinely like, and what does that maybe? Attest to this, we were genuinely like the mediator, but we were also like the connector. We were trying to basically put together like a piecemeal of everything together. So, um, I mean, that's where I see the, the role of the architect. And I don't know if that starts to answer your question, but um, really um, 
within Saudi, again, I have to say within Saudi because we really responded to a very Saudi context. While I was based in London, we were working with Saudi archives, like we were working with a Saudi institution, so to speak. So the role of the architect, interestingly enough, is not very clear. And having to explain that to people is something that we actually had to witness and explore during this process. I mean, me and Basman Hassa obviously have experience, you know, by doing um, our work in Mecca. But this was like at a whole different um, arena. And as in, because it was for Venice. So the it, we kind of have to build the role of the architect, if that makes sense. Like we really like, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Yeah, that's how it is. Like we're building what the architect is meant to be beyond like brick and mortar, so to speak, as in this kind of like research arena. It's also interesting in this context of bureaucracy. Uh, it seems like a, a term that's used more commonly in the in the Gulf and across the Middle East is the idea of the engineer and the architect is somehow subsumed under it. And then once you enter into these spaces of hyper uh, accelerated late capitalist development, like the UAE has already been through it, uh, which is a context I'm a little more familiar uh, with from my own uh, 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 upbringing, um, the, the star architect kind of emerges and then architecture emerges as a discipline that kind of merits its own uh, value. So I think what Hossam is speaking about, about this kind of having to create uh, the role of the architect as someone who shapes urban landscapes, whose practice is socially responsible, who's re uh, trying to um, activate kind of change both uh, uh, in the in the built built environment, but then also socially uh, and maybe even philosophically, um, I think is uh, is definitely very much the case. I think I will follow up on what what Hussam said about the, basically creating the the space for for architect to 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 have any role uh, basically within the Polish countries. I think that's quite true because I mean the role of the architect at the moment is yeah is basically somewhere in the background. Uh, so uh, while we are you while we are using the historical uh, case studies as as the guys from the for the Saudi pavilion, it's I think for the for the for the same reason is to to use them as examples on one hand for for some and as cautionary tales in others. So basically, in order to show what are the results of projects that are not deliberately uh, structured and framed, uh, what basically can be the outcomes uh, within the countryside. So what we are trying to do is to emphasize that the role of the architect within the countryside, first of all, should be visible, the project should be deliberate, and we should talk on the level of policy first, and then talk uh, secondly on the, on the level of form itself. Uh, so I think that's quite important for us, and maybe also trying to bind this with the with the question that appeared in chat. So what are the next steps or what the research project brought to us as, as further, uh, let's say, endeavors? So what we are looking at uh, right now is to try to create the policy or the policy framework to to transform the one of the case studies that we uh, talked. So the let's say the exemplary case of the socialist period, meaning the uh, multifamily housing within the countryside. So that's somehow the, the outcome of the uh, of the exhibition to to make those cases visible and try to reintroduce uh, an architectural project to the countryside rather than just, uh, let's say, um, a state project that is, uh, in Polish case, a hidden means to uh, mitigate the, the housing crisis that is currently uh, occurring. So, yeah, to try to think about it a bit more uh, precisely and uh, within a structured manner. So I, I hope that answers the, the, the role of the architect uh, that we're yeah, trying no, to undertake. That, that's great. And I think in both cases, like, I think, I think it's different in different contexts what that role should be, but I think we all have to advocate for maybe a more expanded role of the architect. And I think that's also partially why things like biennales are useful because they allow us to change maybe what the public perception is of the architect beyond just bricks and mortar. Um, but just to reiterate the question in the chat by Joe Grant is what have um, both curators and um, <laughs> teams discovered from their research that they'll bring and implement to their next socially responsible architectural projects. So I guess, Voce, you answered that just now, but I don't know, Hassam and Murtaza, if you, what are the lessons um, learned that you might take away going forward? Yeah, so I mean, uh, foundational to my practice, to our practice in Studio Bound is, um, and um, uh, maybe you probably know this, like we were very much research heavy, we're very much history heavy, and that's generally always the at the foreground and at the background of everything we want to do when it comes to Saudi. 
So a lot of the projects that we're currently working on in Saudi have to do with restoration and heritage. Um, and uh, one of the projects we're working on is like in the old city of Jeddah working, for example, um, on a UNESCO heritage site. And what we take away from Venice and what we take away from these experiences is really just asserting the role and the valued role of research and and um, and archives. Because again, I, I think in the West, at least in this part of the world, we sometimes take a, a lot of our institutions for granted, be it libraries or universities. But again, in Saudi, when you have to really basically claw your way into any institution that has any information, that's something for us that we take seriously. And that's something we will always bring back to our work in order to become socially, so to speak, responsible, because we have to reconcile with our past in order to basically move forward with any other thing. And again, it sounds a bit of a cliche, but again, within the context of Saudi, there is a lot, again, this is somewhat of a political statement. There's a lot of whitewashing that's happening. There's a lot of revisionist history that occurs, uh, be it from more institutional levels or from more grassroots level. And for us, it's really, that's why understanding and cementing his, like history and documenting that is very important. And that's something we take very seriously. I think uh, I think for us um, the the kind of utopian potential of architecture is kind of important, but how one fosters that within a context like Saudi Arabia is uh, is 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 tricky because uh, um, because the 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 bureaucracy that kind of controls uh, uh, construction and permits and things like that is pretty uh, uh, significant and heavy, and and so how to kind of keep that. Uh, um, desire for for socially responsible architecture, for an architecture that produces social change, uh, environmental change, uh, um, is is a tricky phenomenon. But I think um, is a, is. But I think what Hussam is talking about about the importance of history and the importance of archives is key in that uh, because if people recognize uh, what's come before um, and the solutions that were presented and implemented, or maybe even not implemented, it kind of uh, maintains that um, to some degree. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I think that this relationship with history is extremely interesting and so fascinating to see the two pavilion together, I think, because it's a, there is a sort of, uh, on one hand, I think there is, there, is a, there is a stark difference between the two. Because in, in the Saudi pavilion, um, there is this need of unveiling this history before really like, jumping and explaining like what you said I think also Murtasa is the idea of learning from history which is in a in let's say in in the European context uh, we we have been working on this learning for history at least ideally <laughs> on paper we should we are doing it since quite a long time but there are of course portions of the world in which that history is not yet knowledgeable right like it's not something that everyone's know and everyone is aware of and I think that there is a step that is is needs to be done, right? Like that step of like really bringing that history out and really like allow everyone to just be on the same on the same at the same pace. And I think that that's a very interesting. I, I didn't realize this until now now that you are discussing it. It's really this. There is a very different approach to history, which is I find it extremely fascinating because on the other hand. The Polish pavilion, what it does, I mean, you 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 work on archival work, but what you do in the pavilion, what you show us in the pavilion is already something projected, right? Even that panorama is something that is entirely constructed. It's not the status quo itself, right? Like it's something that is is a sort is a sort of project in itself. And I think that there is that that really shows that there is a sort of different approach towards history, which I find it extremely extremely fascinating probably. Um, I, I have maybe, I don't know if someone from the audience has some questions. Um, you can either write them in the chat or just use the hand raise system. Is there anyone that is keen on? Because otherwise, I, I have a few questions more, <laughs> which I find it. Um, I think it's it's worth probably just have a have just a, a, a few words on it. But I think since we are discussing not just about the research itself, but about an, a research within an exhibition, I think that there is a, a portion of this research which is entirely 
is entirely subjected to a curatorial aspect, right? Like, so how do we show this? How do we make this understandable to everyone? And uh, I think that there is it's a totally different approach in both pavilion. Of course, for the one who are not familiar with Venice, pavilions are assigned at the places of the pavilion, I think are assigned. Um, uh, and sometimes you are unlucky with, with the space. Sometimes you're extremely lucky. Um, but I, I think so that, of course, that the sort of like limitation, the um, constrictions, let's say, of the spatial constriction can be very, very tough. Uh, but also, I think that that is always very beautiful to see different approaches to to, the, to different spaces and also to understand the role, you know, of audience. You're really presenting something to someone that is not necessarily an architect, right? Like the audience of the Venice um, exhibition is most of the time, especially across the year, is a lot of kids in the school trips, for instance. So, you know, you also have to take into account these other aspects. Uh, and I'm just curious to see, to ask, how does your research really take shape, take, takes really the shape of the exhibition and what was the process? I, I can take a stab at that to start off with, unless Wojcik, you want to go first. I mean, I, I want to start off by saying with the Polish pavilion, I think it's a really amazingly elegant solution, uh, this idea of this kind of panorama as a curtain or a screen, uh, because it really highlights the fact that it's a surface that can both receive a projected vision, uh, but it's also something that can obscure things from uh, from view as well. It's the way billboards work in in parts of the Gulf where you see uh, a vision of the urban like 10 years before it's going to happen, but it's also an, a vision that's obscuring the act of construction behind it as well. So I, I, I was really, I, I thought it was really beautiful. Um, and I'm, I hope to get to see it next, uh, next month. Um, in terms of how we handle things, um, I, I think, uh, and this, uh, Hussam will speak about this, uh, you know, can speak about this in more, more detail, but we did want the spaces not to be kind of very dry, um, um, archival displays. Um, so there are very subtle cues uh, within the within the spaces um, that we feel like uh, are phenomenological or experiential to people who are familiar with the the built environment or the context in Saudi Arabia or in the Gulf uh, will kind of pick up on. Um, and that was kind of intentional, uh, very much so. Um, um, Saudi Arabia comes with uh, with a lot of baggage, to say the very least. Like everybody approaches any sort of a cultural exhibition about Saudi Arabia with their own preconceived notions, and so we wanted to really uh, kind of uh, tiptoe this fine line between not giving the audience what they want, but also giving them something that was off uh, the, the 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 place of the country that we were representing. And and you know, like I think Hussam and uh, Basman Hessa came up with a lot of really elegant elegant. Uh, uh, solutions as to how we do that. And I think uh, it's been borne out, like the comments that we have received from uh, visitors who are familiar with the Gulf, uh, you know, these kind of, I guess you could call them inside jokes, but uh, they, people kind of picked up on them. So I, I don't know, Hussam, if you want to add a little bit to that. I, I was purposely vague to let um, you know. No, I think you said it very eloquently. The only thing um, I would add, and I think that's something that Francesca, you found quite importantly, is who is the audience for these biennales? And this is something that we constantly uh, well, not necessarily struggle with, but like really um, debated because from experience, like um, I think the role of the audience is very key because we always do question about how is this going to translate, whether it's to the Venice crowd or whether it's going to be to the Saudi crowd or whether it's going to be to the ministry, you know, because and it was always like trying to find that fine line and balance. And from experience, at least, uh, biennales sometimes tend to get very tedious and very tiring. And this is something that we also wanted to um counter because again especially i can speak from our like i don't know like who's ever been to our pavilion there's a lot of text and there's a lot of research and that was always again i think it's always a challenge with any well not necessarily any but with a lot of uh pavilions is like managing how much information you can give because also you don't want it to just be like a barrage of like endless text because no one's actually going to read it so so yeah i think um how it ends up being translated for us was always this like delicate balance of the visual versus the information. And I really have to underline the institution. Like we have an institution to, like we are working with an institution back home, but we're also catering to the Venice crowd. Not to say that that filters what you say, but that definitely 
uh, sort of mediates how you say it, I would say. Um, and I think that's something very important when we talk about audience. Um, so yeah. No, and I think also, um, you know, spatially, uh, there were some key elements that came out of our conversations, because of course, there was a lot of like thought and workshop and research that went into uh, the design of the final spaces. So the hotel space is kind of anchored by this corridor, because we were really struck by how hotels and hospitals both share this corridor and this unit structure off of it, and how actually that shared structure makes it very easy for one to move one into the other, and how in... That, that architecture in some sense is both an architecture of hospitality, but also a carcel architecture, an architecture of discipline or, uh, or control or, or imprisonment. So there is, this, um, there is this corridor and, you know, we used like fancy marble for the corridor to kind of mimic the fancy hotels in, the, in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And then, of course, the doors on the side. I'm saying we, I mean, these were all Studio Bounds ideas. And then in the island, the island, you know, the display is literally a set of islands. But again, um, the, the, these, these kind of um, topographical uh, models, uh, they're all finished in, a, in this kind of like surgical steel, which was meant to evoke this kind of like the conditions of sanitation, um, the medical equipment, bedpans, surgical equipment, that sort of stuff. So there are these subtle like phenomenological, textural, material clues. And then in the home, um, the, it's, it's basically a, a square structure with a platform in the middle. So the platform was a little bit of a play on the idea of Zoom completely transforming the threshold between uh, public and private within Saudi Arabia, which is a, a threshold that is very carefully, or was until the pandemic, very carefully controlled. Uh, but then, you know, this kind of like faux turf and uh, the, 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 the fake bougainvillea on the side, uh, they were ways in which uh, to uh, kind of sustainably without killing any plants, uh, kind of evoke the garden, but also these uh, kind of uh, um, synthetic representations of vegetal life are also very commonly seen within um, Gulf interiors and uh, even within Gulf gardens, actually, just because uh, maintaining an actual lawn is, uh, uh, is expensive and, and just completely unsustainable sometimes in, in, in given the cost of water. So there were also these little subtle cues that we were trying to uh, put in that were basically abstractions of the case studies that we were working with uh, in our research. Yes, to try to answer from my side to the question, I think it, 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 it to some extent, uh, connects with what Hussam said about layers and to how to present the outcome of the research to, to different audience. And, and I think in, in our case, what is uh, really important in within the project was that we were working under the uh, guidance or basically the Commissioner of the Polish Pavilion is the National Gallery of Art. So they are responsible and their expertise lies uh, in art world. So basically we were from the very beginning scrutinized from the perspective of non-architects uh, to all our uh, ideas of the exhibition. So we went through a couple of iterations as you can imagine, and that's how we end up. So I think it's, uh, what I want to say is that I think it's quite important to underline this role, that we're working with the art curators with a really long experience that are commissioners of the pavilion, and therefore we had the feedback from them uh, as architects, since we are rather a uh, young team, or maybe not young, but unexperienced uh, in, in exhibitions. Uh, so I think that was quite important to have this oversight of the commissioner. So, and then talking about layers that, uh, that Hussam mentioned, I think also what was informing our decisions on how to present the research within the pavilion is simply the position of Polish pavilion within Giardini. We are at the very end, or at least one of the last pavilions to be visited since we are on the other side. I mean, we are within the Giardini, but you have to cross a bridge to enter Polish pavilion. So it was also, I mean, we were aware of this, and then we we're also aware that people would come to Polish pavilion maybe in the second half of the day, meaning that they are going to be tired and maybe not uh, that willing to uh, read uh, 2000 word text uh, to uh, understand the exhibition. Therefore, we had this very um, simple idea from the very beginning to uh, to divide the, let's say the curatorial tours into three. So we had the really small tour that was three minutes just to see the panorama and understand the, the gist of the, of the exhibition. Then we had a, a bit longer one that we could also describe the projective uh, 
uh, models and projects that are uh, presented within the pavilion. And then we had a long one that we are also bringing the uh, the catalog that actually um, explains and uh, and shows the research. So uh, we are trying to work with layers uh, in, in in that sense. And, and I mean, uh, I think what, what what is also quite interesting and important is that. To very end, we didn't know how the how the pavilion is going to turn out. Uh, to the point that uh, during the press days, we are still presenting the pavilion with closed uh, uh, skylight, and then in <laughs> the last day, we decided that actually maybe it works better with uh, with open skylight. So it also shows that uh, basically being on the site uh, on the um, days that the exhibition is mounted and uh, constructed within the space is, is quite important. And Maybe the last one is what I mentioned with the uh, with the with the drawings that we were doing for the for the guys that were preparing the panorama. It's the space itself, so it's it's, it's quite small. So basically, all the elements were catered for the space, as I mentioned, with the perspectives, etc. And I think that somehow um, explains how we approach it, how we try to um, bring the research and explain it or showcase it within the space. Uh, of, of, of Venice uh, Pavilion. Great. Um, there's one more question from the audience. Lara's um, kind of posted in the chat. Yeah, I, I, I saw it and I... Uh... <laughs> um, but maybe, I mean, I guess the, the question is, are there any thoughts about or in dialogue with or in critique of OMA's study of the countryside that links to specifically the Polish pavilion, but I'm guess it's about like, yeah, maybe existing bodies of research that you didn't necessarily like build upon, but um, maybe challenged or critiqued as well um, for both of you, I guess, even for the Saudi pavilion, like um, maybe critiquing previous studies of hotels and and spaces of, of hospitality. But yeah, I don't know whether, uh, Voce, you want to start by talking about yeah. your, your response to um, our main Yeah, study. I will, but I mean, it's... Uh... Yeah, I don't feel in a position to respond, but I will uh, try. Uh, so, I mean, of course, I mean, we are positioned in, in quite interesting uh, moment for the countryside because it's not only OMA uh, doing the, the exhibition, uh, taking the countryside and, and trying to, to talk about this. Also, also Sebastian Marot in, in, in Lisbon in 2019, I believe, with the, with the exhibition taking the countryside. So I think it's uh, quite interesting that we are positioned uh, in this, let's say, line of, uh, of, of thinking and curatorial uh, endeavors to, to think about the countryside, to try to uh, unveil its potential. Uh, so I think that's quite important for us to to acknowledge, and also I mean, of course, obviously we were building on the uh, on the knowledge that was presented through the through the catalogs because we didn't have a chance to see the one in New York because I think it was closed uh, just shortly after the COVID outbreak. Uh, but learning from the catalogs of both, uh, we are having some thoughts and trying and, and and we try to implement implement them in, in ours. So for instance. I think uh, within the OMA's exhibition, let's say the plethora of topic was was something that we were a bit uh, critical towards. So I mean, it, it was trying to capture the countryside as this one homogeneous space uh, around the globe, and, and, and I found it problematic. Therefore, for us, it was important to to pinpoint and focus on the post-socialist countryside, uh, because, precisely because we were able to to find similarities between countries like. Uh, or, or the countrysides of, of, of Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There were similarities to to, to be drawn uh, out of this. And then what I think uh, we found quite interesting, uh, looking at the Sebastian Maros exhibition, were the, the the projective scenarios at the very end of the catalog. So basically, looking at what what are the possibilities and what are the uh, pathways towards the future, uh, looking at the countryside. So I think those were the basically the things that we were building. On and trying, uh, we are trying to elaborate. And I mean, uh, for me, it was always very important to underline that. I mean, uh, for us, is uh, what, what is important is to to propel the discussion around the countryside, maybe from the specific point of the post-socialist uh, region, but still to propel it. So I hope there will be uh, more exhibitions uh, to follow and to build and to critique our work. Great, and then I guess um, I, Isam and Murtaza, did you did, are there any key references or things that you were challenging in the 
I mean, I think, um, so for our exhibition, I suppose it depends on which section, but I would tackle, let me just tackle like the islands, because for us, that was a very interesting one, because when we studied the islands of quarantine within Saudi, primarily the uh, Red Sea quarantine atlas, which we projected earlier on, what was interesting is all the references of those were strictly non-Saudi, so because they were done during the time of, like, this was basically the height and might of the Ottoman Empire, which is um, obviously a very contentious subject matter. So a lot, a lot, so a lot of our references for that were um, exhibitions or uh, books or archives that were either housed in Istanbul in the National Library. And for us, that was quite interesting to have that, I suppose, um, alternative reading as opposed to what the Saudi depiction was, um, because if anything, it just gave a counterweight to what one might read within the National Archive of King Fahad or King Abdul Aziz, etc. So um, I think for us, that um, that general concept of looking towards the alternative archive, if you know what I mean, on the other side, was very good because it genuinely helped ground our, our perspective through everything. And again, hence the importance of all this historical work. Um, but there wasn't, at least for the islands, there was like numerous texts, numerous um, like case studies. I don't think necessarily there was one exhibition that comes to mind that depicted those islands, but um, there was definitely a photography exhibition uh, by the University of Durham, I would say like, I think like seven years ago, which, and through that exhibition, we were lucky to find some, one of the images that we showed today of Suekhan in Sudan. So yeah, stuff like that. But yeah, Mustaz, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, uh, Manita, you, you mentioned like, you know, things that we were maybe working in conjunction with or against. And I think I mentioned the idea of Sikh architecture for me, that was really important because also it legitimizes the role of that history plays within architecture. Uh, because um, so, most, so much of architecture is about the contemporary or the present and about the future. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, architectural historians pay attention to the past, but it's easily overlooked. And I think uh, um, as much as it was a very necessary prompt, I think um, that was one of the issues with Hashim Sarkis's prompt as well. How will we live together? It kind of only uh, validates future futures in some sense. Um, so, uh, uh, so there was that, but um, in terms of thing, thing, things we were thinking against or things that we were hoping to critique, uh, one is kind of uh, looking at the nation state as an exceptional uh, or like an isolated concept. So the reason why the history of pilgrimage and the Red Sea become important is because it uh, situates uh, Saudi Arabia within a, a global network that's over 200 and arguably many millennia old. And, and so that aspect of the Red Sea and the way the Red Sea linked uh, the Gulf to the to South Asia to East Africa, uh, and then through the uh, imperial presence of the Ottomans, and then uh, the British colonial presence after the Ottomans are defeated, um, was a way of linking it also back to Europe. Uh, so that was something that was pretty conscious on our part. We were also working against this kind of uh, cliche that um, is very common within the Gulf and maybe also outside of the Gulf, and that's actually promoted a lot by the Gulf itself as. Uh, as being these lands of hospitality, like hospitality is a very important part of like a Gulf Arab culture. And so we kind of wanted to really like push against that a little bit and see like, you know, hospitality is kind of like a fraught uh, concept because you're the person that you're welcoming, the person you're uh, extending hospitality towards is always someone who is unfamiliar because uh, otherwise then it's just a co community or kinship or family ties. Um, and anyone who's unfamiliar brings with them a certain threat. Uh, and, you know, you have to kind of negotiate that threat and figure out uh, how long, uh, you know, you have to figure out a way of evaluating it before you let them in. So that was definitely the case within the hotel idea. Um, and within the ho home, as I mentioned also previously, is that this this boundary between the public and the private, which is very, um, until recently, very carefully and very strongly maintained uh, in Saudi Arabia, especially like what happens within the home and what happens outside of the home were separated. And, um and the pandemic completely turned that on its head because people had to basically work from their homes and, and, and you couldn't function without inviting the outside virtually into your own domestic spaces. And, and so that was another thing that we were quite conscious about as we were developing the exhibition. Great, thank, thank you. Um, 
I think um, the idea of history being used to also like look backwards, but also look forwards is so important. And it's actually really interesting because over the summer, as part of the summer school public program, we did a book launch of the the Jeff Manoff and um, Nicola Twilley's new book, The Until Proven Safe, The History and Future of Quarantines. So it's a kind of nice kind of way to think about, I guess, history being a kind of productive and proactive tool um, going forward, which is maybe a nice note for us to conclude this conversation, which has been a really great start to the series. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all so much for your time and for everyone who's attended. Uh, I guess, Francesca, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, really. It's been really interesting. And I think I, I really, I love how we can really span uh, across so many different conversation, interesting conversation. I think, thank you very much for your work and for um, inspiring the conversation. I just want a quick reminder for who's here that like we, the, the series runs every Monday. So please join us next Monday because we will have the wonderful British Pavilion and uh, in conversation with the Philippine Pavilion. Um, so yeah, let's join us and hopefully form one, many more conversation to come. Thank you very much, everyone.